All right, everybody okay? Nobody needs to pee, nothing like that? All right, don't you pee on yourself. All right, so I, I, I don't know if you guys have seen this before, but I changed it around a little bit. Um, when I first started doing this four years ago, I used to teach it to residents, so it was very heavy in physics. So I kind of backed off a little bit because I got like the, the death stare from you guys. So I took out a lot of the physics in it and just do some basic stuff so we can spend more time on actually the applications that you guys are going to use it for, all right? So my fourth year doing this, and Zach still can't get it right that I want scotch in the glass, not water, but anyway, there's still time. I guess scotch no, has no carbs. All right, so um, this is what we're going to go over some of the things today. And ultrasound is kind of weird, because I can sit here and talk to you all day long, and then your eyes are going to start bleeding. But the best thing is just to kind of show you a basic way to handle yourself to the machine so you don't stare at it like it's an alien. All right? And then when we go next door with the live models, then we can kind of play around. You can touch the buttons and kind of see, you know, ooh and ah type stuff. So if you start to, like, get a bloody eye, it's fine. Just wipe it away. It's going to be OK. All right, so where's the thingy? There it is. So we're going to go through some basic physics. I swear it's not too much. What we call in the ultrasound world, nobology, just kind of teach you how to use the different knobs to get the perfect image that you're looking for. All right? And then we'll talk about some procedural applications. Most of you in here are APPs, right? So you know, we're in the world of ED metrics and see more patients, do less, kill less patients, that kind of stuff. So what we want you guys to be able to do is to be so proficient in the ultrasound that you can use it to help move your patients through in a safe manner, all right? So be able to like, you know, go into a room and everybody with an abscess want antibiotics and they want you to put a needle in their arm. And you could put it on there and say, look, there really is nothing here for me to drain, all right? So come back next week when it breaks open. All right, so stuff like that. Um, you can use it to do, you know, like your central line processes, just to make sure that patient is safe. <clears throat> we'll do some cardiac ultrasound. We'll talk about something called a poor man's echo to give you a quick idea of how to get a quick echo and ejection fraction for the patient. Because you are concerned, you have CHF, you don't want to give them too much fluids. Get a poor man's echo, and you get a good idea of roughly what the um, ejection fraction is. This is the big one, of course, OBGYN, all right? Going to always going to get that pregnant lady in a, in a low-speed MVC who wants to go to the ER. She doesn't want to go to the ER because her neck hurts. She wants to go to the ER to make sure the baby's OK. So most of the time, you can go in. The first thing I do when I get an MVC a woman who's pregnant, I put the transducer on the abdomen. I show her, look, baby's heart's beating, baby's kicking. And then the stress goes down, the blood pressure comes down, and then they ask to be discharged, all right? Then, of course, for those of you at the trauma center, this is a must for you. There is another advanced course that I teach that just talks about trauma and using the ultrasound in trauma. But you're going to get the basics today, talking about the FAST exam and the eFAST exam. And then other things that we use it for um, in the ED, like uh, interesting foreign body removals. All right, so this is my baby. This is the machine I trained on back in uh, 2006 at Mount Sinai. Um, I'm pretty sure it's in a garbage dump by now. All right. So these are the different types of machines that are out there. I leave this slide up here to, to prove a point. Do not memorize the machine, because you might move around from different sites, different places. Where you train might be different from where you're going to work. Don't memorize the machine. Memorize the function of what you need to get done. All right? So I don't want you to go in and go, well, I've never seen that machine before, so I can't use it. All right? So there are three different, four different types of machines next door. Try to make sure at least you familiarize yourself with them because, again, the buttons might be placed different places, but the function is the same, all right? All right, so the basic knowledge is you got to choose the correct transducer. I know you hear people calling it a probe, but it's not going in the places that you're probing, so please don't call it a probe. It's a transducer, all right? The important thing you want to think of with your transducer is the body habitus. All right, and what we call the footprint. So when you look at the transducer, you might have what's called a wide footprint. So the part that touches a patient is this wide. Or you might have a narrow footprint, which is this narrow. All right? And you think about, what am I looking for? Am I looking between the ribs? And I don't want to use this one. I want to use this one. All right? Am I looking at the abdomen? Then I probably want to use this one, because this is a large 500-pound lady. Okay? And then you want to decide, what view am I looking at? What view is best for me? If I want to see the right kidney, I could probably see it from the anterior abdomen, but it's going to take me about six hours, and the shift will be over. Or I can go to the right flank, where the kidney lies, and see the kidney there. So you think about which view you're looking for, all right? And we'll practice some of those next door. And then, of course, you place the patient in the proper position. You don't always get the opportunity to do this, because if they're intubated and they're very sick, then you can't like, just roll them over, because they're going to end up on the floor. But if you can, and you kind of move them around to make sure you're going to get the best picture possible. 
all right? Because you're using this to make a medical decision. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about frequency versus resolution. So the frequency is the speed, roughly speaking, of which the sound wave leaves the transducer, go in, hit the object that you're looking for, and coming back. That's a frequency. So if you like to run, I don't. But if you like to run and you're a sprinter, I would call you a high frequency transducer. And if you're someone who likes to go for a 25 mile run because you have nothing else to do on Saturday, then I would call you a low frequency transducer. Does that make sense? So when you think about the high frequency transducer, the, those of you who like to sprint, how far can you go sprinting? Not very far, because you're gonna get exhausted, get an MI and die, right? But if you're a low frequency transducer, i.e. you like to go for a nice 25 mile jog, you can go pretty far, right? So move that over to ultrasound transducers now. So if I use a high frequency transducer, I'm not gonna go very far in the body. I'm not gonna get very good depth, right? But if I am a low frequency, I can get real far. So that makes sense. If I wanna do an IJ, high frequency. If I wanna look at a gallbladder, low frequency. Does that make sense? All right, good. So, for example, a 12 megahertz uh, transducer, this is so funny, because I used to explain to people what the megahertz was and teach them how to calculate it, and a few people passed out, so I'm told not to do that anymore. Anyway, it's simple math, right? 12 is bigger than three, right? This is a high frequency, that's a low frequency. Good? That's ultrasound physics. All right, so now we're gonna talk about resolution. So resolution, basically, is how can I make sure my picture looks amazing? All right, so that's basically resolution. And basically the higher the frequency, the better the resolution. So if I use, to go back to our runners now, if I use this, the long distance runner to put an IJ in, I'm not gonna get very good picture. Does that make sense? Because this person is at their prime giving you their best picture at 25 miles, not at six miles, right? So, the higher the frequency, the better the resolution. The lower the frequency, the less the resolution. That makes sense. Use the right transducer for the right thing, you're gonna get the best picture possible, all right? So there we go. The image, electricity basically heats up these crystals here. It sends sound wave out, which hits the organ, bounces back, crystals pick them up, send them to the computer, and you get an image, all right? I like to put this picture up here because when I was doing my fellowship, one of the problems I had was I always get lost. Where is this image? Where's the foot? Where's the head? And so we have basic rules in ultrasound, all right? And so if this is the ultrasound, think of the beam that comes out this way, right? These are your sound waves. And then this is gonna then turn into the same triangle on the screen. So what we say is there's a marker on every transducer. The marker is to go towards the patient's head or towards the patient's right. There's one exception, obviously. When you're doing IJs, the marker matches the IJ. Right IJ, marker goes to the right. Left IJ, marker goes to the left. That's the only exception. Otherwise, always to the patient's head, the marker goes, or to the patient's um, right. And that corresponds on the screen with a little green dot that's gonna be there that indicates where the marker is. So this would be the patient's head, towards the patient's head, and this would be towards the patient's leg. All right? We'll practice that. These are the different types of transducers, and this slide, like the ultrasound slide, is to remind you, do not memorize the, the, the size and the type of transducer, because they can trick you. Just because this one looks like this, doesn't mean that it's a low frequency. Most of the time it is, but you never know. All right, so don't memorize. Look on the transducer and you see the number three, or five, or 17, or 18, and that tells you if it's a high frequency or a low frequency. The only transducer on here that really doesn't need an explanation is this one. I think we all have a pretty good idea where that goes, all right? So that's the OB transducer, and if you're really feeling frisky, you can use it to check the prostate as well, but we don't do that. So the rest of these, go ahead and memorize that, because you know where it's gonna go. The rest of these just kind of work your way through. The one that confuses people the most is this bad boy right here. Because everybody calls it the flat transducer, the vessel transducer, so whenever you're gonna get an IJ, you go and grab for this. But I'll tell you that there are companies that make low frequency transducers like this. It's not that they're trying to trick you, it's because what they're trying to do is manage the footprint. Because if I wanna really get in and get a good look at that gallbladder, but these pesky ribs are always in the way, how about I make a small footprint so that I can get between that rib and get a good picture? Does that make sense? 
So do not memorize what the shape looks like. All right, memorize what it does. I'm gonna go through this real quick, don't pass out. All right, sound is attenuated. Attenuation means loss. Simply, if you go for a 25 mile run, you're going to be more exhausted than the person who went for a five mile run. Make sense? Bring that into ultrasound world. If I'm going to ultrasound the gallbladder of a 675 patient, I'm gonna lose my image quality than if I'm ultrasounding a 75 pound patient. Make sense? All right, and there's nothing you can do about attenuation unless you're gonna put them on an Atkins diet. All right, so the more tissue to penetrate, the more attenuation of signal, the more loss of signal. Does that make sense? All right, stop me if I'm talking too fast. All right, so how do we compensate? You can't fix the attenuation, right? Unless you crash diet that patient, you can't change the body habitus. But there are things that we can do. We can control the quality of the image by turning up what's called the gain. What exactly is the gain? Well, the gain basically is changing the listening time of the ultrasound. So I'll back up a little bit. Ultrasounds came from the Navy, you guys know that? In emergency medicine, unfortunately, most of our technology comes out of the military. So when the submarines came around, the submarines needed a way to detect underwater how close the next submarine is to them. And they would send out something called a ping. It's basically a sound wave traveling through the water. It would hit the enemy submarine and come back. Based on how long it took for it to come back, they basically knew what the distance was to the next submarine. But the problem is, while you're sending out pings, the enemy can also hear you. So they would indicate what's called listening time. So the guy would put on his headphones and he would go, five seconds, listen, and then turn it off so the enemy can't find you. The ultrasound is doing the same thing as well. In order to get the best image, it sends out the sound wave and then it listens for a while and stops. But if you're going through a lot of tissue, you need it to listen a little bit longer. Just another 10 seconds until that sound can come back. And that's what it does, that's what the gain does. So we play with the gain next door, and when you turn up the gain, you turn up the listening time, you get the image will show up. Not the best quality, but it will show up, all right? You turn down the gain, your listening time is short, so your image is nice and sharp. And I'm saying it, and I see blank faces, when you practice it, trust me, it's gonna look beautiful, all right? And you can play with the different parts of the gain that you wanna play with, all right? So the listening gain is basically the same as turning up your stereo. So think about it this way. If you are in the shower and your Nicki Minaj comes on and you're like dancing like crazy, right? You guys listen to Nicki Minaj, I know you do. All right, um, so when you're in the shower, you have to balance for the sound of the shower, right? You can't just have your iPhone playing at regular volume. So what do you do? You turn it up as high as it can. What does it do to the sound quality when it's at the maximum? <coughs> It's not the best. You can hear that it's Nicki Minaj, but you can't hear every single sound, right? All the enunciation. It's the same thing that happens to the ultrasound. When you turn up the gain, you're gonna increase the listening time. You are gonna get the image, but it's not gonna be the best. It's gonna have crappy quality. So be mindful of that, and there's nothing you can do about that, all right? So as you increase the gain, the image gets brighter, and you decrease the gain, the image gets darker. And that's what it looks like. So these are the different types of gain that you can have. You can have an overall gain where the whole image changes, or you can have near gain where you're just looking for what I can fix closer to the transducer or far gain what's lower down. So look at this. This is the basically balanced perfect picture. All right, you guys can see that, it looks nice. You can see your gray dots, black dots, your white dots, all right? Don't worry about where this is, we'll go about that. But if you have problems with your near field, which is here, you can't really see what's going on here. I can't see anything, it's just black. I can see the kidney, but what is going on up here? I don't know. So to fix this, I would change my near gain, all right? Same thing here. I can see everything going on here, but I don't know what's going on. I can't see the kidney really well. I don't know what's going on here. I would change my far gain. Does that make sense? That's all it means, all right? And if the whole image is bad, then you change the total gain. Don't freak out, guys. I promise you we're gonna go through it next door and it's gonna make sense. All right, so again, you wanna look at a skin, for example. The ultrasound transducer is right here, so the first thing must be the epidermis. Then you get a little bit of loose connective tissue, all right? And this is your fascia here with the muscle interface, and then you have the muscle, and then you have bone. And as you look through it, you can see different grades and different shades of gray, right? Something that's a little bit thicker, is a little bit wider, all right? There's the bone, it's a little bit wider than the muscle, okay? 
So if an ultrasound beam was passing through here, it would slice through the adipose tissue quite well. It would slow down a little bit in the muscle because it's a little more dense, and it absolutely would bounce off the bone. Does it make sense? All right, good. All right, let's look at some images now. So tendons kind of look like, um, if you take a picture of uh, or a video of cars moving on the highway, and you speed it up 10 times fast, that's kind of what tendons look like. You can't miss them, look at that. So that's a tendon. And what's beautiful about a tendon is the tendon sheath. It's a little bit thicker, and a little bit wider there and there. Why is that important? Because if you have a partial tear of a tendon, you will see white, 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 black, a little black line going down here, and then it continues. That's a partial tear in a tendon. If you will see a full tear of a tendon, you will see a nice big chunk here, and then it will look like someone blew up a bridge. There'll be a big chunk missing, and then the tendon will continue there. All right? So that's something you can do quite easy. You get a sports injury, um, and you want to look and see, is the biceps intact, or is the Achilles intact? You put the ultrasound and transducer on, and you look at it. And what um, transducer would you use for a tendon? and the biceps, which is superficial, would be a high frequency. Yeah, the, sp the, the sprinter, all right? Same thing with the Achilles, because it's right there. All right, this is my favorite, because this is what I like to show people who come into the ER at 4 a.m. wanting me to drain the abscess. I have this abscess, it's just terrible. You gotta drain it. My, my sister you know, is a nurse, and she said, go to the ER, they're gonna drain it. And of course, immediately you're irritated because they said that. So I usually go, and I put the transducer on, and then I say, there really is nothing here. Pus is, I tell him before, I say, when I put this transducer on your abscess, if it's a big pus pocket, it's gonna be a big black circle. And then I'm gonna shove a needle in there and then suck the pus out and they go, perfect, that's what I want. And then I put this on and I'm like, oh look, and they, they see it too. So now I got buy-in from them, right? They're not gonna resist me. They're like, you're right, there's no big black thing. But what about that? I'm like, no, 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 it's a blood vessel. You don't wanna, no, you don't wanna do that, <laughs> all right? But there's no big, I said, I said if you want, I can t drain all of these little ones, but I'm gonna stab you with a needle about eight times. And they go, no, no, I'll just, I'll just come back. And that's usually what I want. And you know, they get a script and they go. But this has a name, all right? This is called cobblestoning, right? Like walking down the street in Italy. This is called cobblestoning. And so you would, you would document that in your, in, your, in your documentation. Bedside ultrasound of the um, abscess showed cobblestoning, no indication for IND at this time. It's a perfect little excuse when they press candy people come take a look at you, all right? And let's stop working. Zachary? Yeah, what, sorry. All right, now, here we have a different situation, right? Where this guy comes in and he tells you that, um, you know, he just spent five days in Taiwan eating everything he could find and drinking whatever water he wants because he's uh, invincible. And then like it's a week later and then he's coming with high fever, right upper quadrant pain and you pop the ultrasound on and you see this. All right, so that's an abscess. That's a liver abscess, irregular border, abscess, all right? What do you do, you put a needle in there and drain it? Oh no, 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 no. Um, you, 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 know, you admit this guy and let the proper people take care of him. But that you can see there, you could document that as a intrahepatic irregular um, abscess, all right? And you see how it's not nice and clear and black like the blood vessel, this is blood, obviously. This has like a little thing in there, that's like proteinaceous material, so you know it's an abscess and not like a cyst. Does that make sense? All right. So let's talk a little bit about trauma. So the FAST exam, the focus assessment of sonography for trauma, replaced something called DPL. You guys ever heard of DPL? Diagnostic peritoneal lavage. Back in the day when they were suspicious for intra-abdominal trauma, they would shove a giant needle just below your belly button and they would dump about 500 cc to a liter of fluid in your abdomen and then turn the bag upside down so it would run out and then if it turns red, you're positive. And then you go to the OR an hour later, all right? Fast exam, the ultrasound now, can be done in about, if done properly, you can do a proper fast exam in about, mm, about a minute, all right? 45 seconds if you're super good, all right? And so what it's doing is it lets you look at specific dependent portion of the body. So if your trauma patient is laying down, the dependent portion are gonna be here, down in the pelvis, all right? So you look there, and then you also look to make sure there's no um, pericardial fluid because they can die from tamponade. Uh, and what this does was it actually uh, decreases the door to OR time. So a patient comes in, seatbelt sign, positive fast, hypotension, that's it. You don't need a CAT scan, you don't need another fancy stuff, two large RIVs and they go, all right? 
Um, most places where you work, surgeons are, if you call a surgeon and go, hey, I got a guy here, positive seatbelt sign, MVC, uh, positive fast exam, his pressure is 80. They're gonna say, I'm on my way, right? Where I did my fellowship, the trauma surgeon in charge did not believe in ultrasound. So she said, you can do a fast exam, but it's just for training. I'm not gonna take the patient to OR until the DPL is done, 45 minutes later. So anyway, but most of those surgeons should have hopefully retired by now. So basically, you're looking at the uh, four areas, the dependent areas here, all right? the bladder, and then of course looking around the heart. We have moved on now to something called the EFAST. So one of the things we've added on is looking at the lungs to see if there's pneumothoraces. So we're not sending people to CAT scan with pneumothorax who then tensions and die in the CAT scan. And if anyone here ever run a code in radiology, you know nothing is worse. Nothing ruins your day more than hearing code blue CAT scan. Nothing, nothing really ruins your day. Well, maybe sickle cell pain. Yeah, that might, that might help. <laughs> All right. So, um, so we're looking at the perihepatic region at the hepatorenal space called Morrison's pouch, the perisplenic region, all right, the cul-de-sac, pouch of Douglas in women, and the pericardium. Those are the places that you're gonna look to find out if there's blood. It takes about um, 300 cc's of blood to make a fast exam positive. That's pretty significant, all right? Because if you think about it, if I, if I poke you with a, um, like a diabetic needle to check for Accucheck and have you drop it in a couple 10 cc's of, uh, of saline, it's gonna look bright red, isn't it? All right, so one of the things that increase the accuracy of the FAST exam is, you know if it's positive, that's at least 300 cc's of blood in the abdomen. So that's the good thing about it, all right? And what it does, it, it moves these potential spaces. So when you look at the space between the liver and the kidney, the, usually there's nothing there, all right? But it's a potential space. When there's blood, it kind of moves into the space and pushes the kidney um, down and then you start to see this little black um, sliver here. And that's a positive fast, okay? So there's another one. Now sometimes you might get the, um, the liver cirrhosis guy that comes in short of breath and you put the ultrasound transducer on, you see this massive fast exam. You see, that's, that's something that you'll see with ascites. But here's another one again, and it's positive. And here's a really positive one, all right? This is probably about a liter and a half to two liters of blood in the abdomen, all right? Beautiful liver, you can see there. I'm sure mine doesn't look like that. All right, so perisplenic view. The perisplenic view is a little different because the spleen is a little more retroperitoneal. So when you move your hand across the patient to do the perisplenic view, you go all the way down to the bed and touch it. And then you slowly work your way up and then you'll see the perisplenic view. And what you're looking for is the potential space between the spleen renal ligament, all right? So that's where you're trying to get to. And we're gonna practice this. Now, there's the spleen. You can see large amounts of blood here. And there's the kidney. And there's a little bit of blood collected down here as well. This big white thing right here is diaphragm, okay? Sometimes you can see um, hemorrhage, subcapsular hemorrhage in the spleen. And you can say, fast exam is showing subcapsular hemorrhage, but you cannot say this is a grade one splenic lac or a grade two splenic lac or a grade three. You can say it's not a grade four, because a grade four, the capsule is ruptured, but you can't call a surgeon and go, yeah, I think there's a grade two spleen like I can see in the ultrasound. No, you can't say that. All right? This one is, it's a, it's a very good scan, because you get very good data. It's, a, it's the most technically difficult scan that you're probably gonna do, because it's very body habitus um, dependent, and that's a sub xiphoid view, all right? So a lot of time, you know, in a small, thin patient, very easy. But if the patient's a little bit larger, you can have a pretty hard time. If they're intubated and the stomach's overinflated and they haven't put an NG tube in, again, you can have a hard time really getting the transducer down because you're almost laying the transducer flat on the abdomen and trying to work your way up to get a sub xiphoid view. But in the fast world, it's the one that you want to use. Fortunately for us, most trauma patients are thin with good veins. So there you go. Again, there's a little sliver of liver. Remember, the transducer is here. Your heart sits like this, right? So the first thing you're gonna see is the right side of the heart. Just remember that. And the last thing, or the deepest thing you'll see is the left side of the heart, because the heart sits like this. So people always get confused with which chamber is which. Just don't remember, the transducer is here. The first thing it goes through is the right side of the heart, and the last thing it goes through is the left side of the heart. All right? It's very easy. Look for the big hole, that's the ventricle. The smaller hole is the atria. So if you go, Transducer, a little bit of liver, right side of my heart, this is my right ventricle, it's the bigger one, it's the bigger hole. All right, and that's my right atrium, that's the smaller hole. And then it must go across something. This little thing right here, what is that? The interventricular septum, right? We all know that. 
and you go down into the bottom part, which is the left side of the heart. The bigger one, the left ventricle, the smaller one, the left atria. And when you get super, super nerdy and good, then you can start talking about things like the outflow track, all right? And then you can start saying, ooh, that must be the tricuspid valve, that must be the bicuspid valve, the mitral valve there, and I can see little vegetations, and then, then, you, then you're really good. Top drawer. All right. <clears throat> so there's another sub xiphoid view. And you can see the heart here. It's a very large effusion. All right. Very large effusion there. There's another picture there. So again, transducers here, right side of the heart, left side of the heart. Look for the big hole. That's it right there. Look for the little hole. You can barely see it. So what is that? It's a collapse. Don't say tamponade. Don't do that. All right, tamponade is a clinical, clinical um, diagnosis. You cannot diagnose tamponade on ultrasound. So I'll scold you guys about that in two slides. But you can see here, you can say, I have a large effusion with left, uh, right ventricle collapse, and I cannot see the right atria at all. And there you can see, of course, the left uh, ventricle and the left atria, all right? This video did not play, right, guys, no? All right, so the part of the EFAS is to look for the pneumothoraces. So what we're looking for is the pleura, that's right there, and you guys will see it. And if, you could, if the video worked, which I was told it wasn't, as you take a deep breath in and breathe out, you see this little white line here, the pleura, it just starts to slide back and forth. And that's, what, that's normal, that's what's supposed to happen. When you have a pneumothorax, that doesn't happen. All right, here's a larger fusion. Right? So again, transducer, right side structures, left side structures. All right? Something else that can help you, this wall is thicker than this wall. And there's a nice septum there, and a very large effusion that you can see in the, in the sac there. And you want to call it tamponade. I, I know you do. I can feel it. But it cannot. All right? Here's another bigger one there. So is this tamponade? No. Good. So what do you need for tamponade? You need the IJs to be going through the roof. You need the patient to be hypotensive. So you need that piece. You can't just look at that and say, tamponade. You could say, large effusion. Pretty crappy effusion, but yes. All right? Again, same thing. Transducer is here. Going through. Go through the effusion. Right side structures. Left side structures. All right? Septum. All right? OK. Cardiac. Um, so these are the views. I want you to kind of memorize, all right? We all know the sub xiphoid view, all right? Then we have our apical view, which is right here. I like to go to the apical view. These guys can be a little challenging based on um, body habitus as well, but this is a cool one. Because when you get that large body habitus and you can't get a good um, sub xiphoid, this is the one I go to next because you can get another good view of the heart to look for effusion. So if this fails, or if it's too painful for the patient, just move over there. You might run into um, breast tissue, move it over to the side, and get it under the ribs right here, and you can get a good cardiac view. This is to look at the basic function of the heart, two and three, parasternal long axis and the parasternal short axis. This is where you can get a good look at the squeeze of the ventricles, all right? So when you're going into your poor man's echo, these are the two views you're gonna use, all right? The parasternal long is gonna show you the entire heart and you can see things like septal bow if it's a pulmonary embolism. You can see like, you know, left, left ventricular wall dysfunction. You can see all that good stuff. And then when you turn it to the parasternal uh, short, you get to get a nice round view of the ventricle. And you just move the transducer back and forth until you get something called a fish mouth where it looks like a fish breathing. And then you say, pretty good, that's it. And how do you do the poor man's echo? It's a big circle and you stare at it, and as it contracts, you keep staring, and then you make a guess. That's why it's a poor man's echo. And you go, hmm, this is 100%, and when it squeezed, it went down this much. 50%, oh, that's my injection fraction. But if it goes like this, all right, then it's about 20, 30% injection fraction. Does that make sense? It's a poor man's echo, all right? There's no number, it's just you guessing the squeeze, all right? And we'll practice that next door. So this is where we put the transducer for the apical view, and this is what you get. This is why I said it's a really good substitute for your sub xiphoid view, because you can see beautifully the structures of the heart. And you know anatomy always screws with you, right? So this is not the right ventricle, because it's on the right side, right? It's like reading a CAT scan on an x-ray. This is the right ventricle. This is the left ventricle, all right? OK, so there we go. So you got left, you got a right, and there you go. You got, you got a good look at the valves a little bit. 
All right, but what you can see is the pericardium, which is, which is what you're looking for. But when you use that, you can kind of see how everything is squeezing in relation to, to other, another. You can see the septum, and if there was a septal bow, then you know what's going on, right? Big PE with bow into the ventricle, left ventricle. All right. There's another apical view showing a nice effusion, and that tamponade. All right. These are a parasternal long. You can see how it slices through the heart there and the image that it's going to give you. All right, so you can look at aortic outtrack flow and stuff like that, evaluate the left atria, all right? All right, that's where we look, and that's kind of what you get, all right? There you go, there's your aorta, all right, there's your left ventricle, and then you get the parasitical short. You can see it kind of slices right through the heart itself, all right? And so you get this like little, what they call this little fish mouth here. And you change to get rid of this, because you're, re you're really not interested in this that much. This is what you're looking at. You can see the papillary muscles, you can see the, the ventricular wall, and then you look and see the depth from this, from here to here, and how much it closes off when it contracts, and that's your rough percentage estimate. Um, there's your sub xiphoid, which again, like I said, can be a little painful, but you can see it looks like the apical view almost. All right, you can still almost get like the apical view. You can really evaluate the pericardium, which is nice. All right, and this is our fast exam, just me talking again, and there, very painful. And this is pretty much what you get. Is your right ventricle, right atria, left and left, and this is your effusion around your pericardium here. There's another large effusion. And then of course, we'll measure that over there. This is something that is new now that we use in sepsis to measure how much fluid we think our patient's gonna need. You're looking for the IVC collapse during inhalation. And we'll practice that next door as well. All right, I must be in love with effusion, geez. All right, so again, this was my, in my fake attempt at making sure you understand that you cannot get, um, you cannot get a tamponade from, you cannot diagnose tamponade with ultrasound. All right, that's it.